Good morning. We welcome you to our services. We are so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. We are excited about the opportunity to worship the Lord together, and we invite you to stand as we do so. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never ends. Now and throughout eternity, I'll praise the one who died for me. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God who my blessings go. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God from whom my blessings go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father, we thank You that we can come into Your presence right now to praise You for who You are for what You have done. Lord, we stop this morning and we ask, God, that our praise and our worship would be pleasing to You. Lord, because truly You have blessed us in so many ways. All blessings flow from You. All good gifts come from You. So God, we stop and we thank You for the multiple ways that You have blessed us. So God, we ask this morning that our praise, our worship, will be pleasing to You You, as we come before the very throne of God. Lord, we are needy people today. Lord, we need You. Lord, there are many today that are hurting, that are struggling. Lord, some have doubts, some have fears, some have questions in their mind today. So Lord, we come before You today asking for that God from from whom all blessings flow, come and meet those needs right now. Lord, if there be anyone in our service this morning who does not know You as the Savior of their life, Lord, may the greatest blessing they could ever receive, the gift of salvation, come into their life today. May they trust You as the Savior of their life. As Christians, remind us, dear Lord, this morning of the great blessing we have in just knowing You, being able to worship You today. What a true blessing that is in our life. Lord, help us to never take for granted what it means to worship our Savior and our Lord. Very privileged we have this morning to come into Your presence. Lord, what a blessing. So we we praise and we thank You, God, for all that You are and all that You have done and all that You are going to do. God, You are truly good. And it's in Your precious name that we pray. All God's people said, 
God is good. And all the time. We invite you to memorize Scripture with us every week, and there is a verse of Scripture in your bulletin that's also up on the screen. So if you will, say it with me this morning. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Psalm 37, 16. Say that again. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Psalm 37, 16. And you're saying, Brother Mark, what does that mean? Here it is. Say it with me. God measures wealth by devotion, not dollars. Isn't that amazing? Say, Brother Mark, I don't have much to give. He wants your life. He wants your life. I've said this before in this pulpit, and I'll say it again. If God has your heart, I don't have to worry about your money. If He has your heart, I don't have to worry about where your money's at. I'm convinced this morning, if you love Him, everything's going to fall into place. Amen? We're going to sing that chorus one more time, that hymn. Sing it with us. Greet one another. Say God has been good this morning to your neighbor. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God who saved my soul. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God who saved my soul. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You may be seated. I will sing praise, I will lift my voice, I will sing praise, I've made my choice, I will sing praise in all I do, I will sing praise to you. Sing that again, I will sing praise. I will sing praise, I will lift my voice. I will sing praise, I've made my choice. I will sing praise in all I do. I will sing praise to you. No matter the storms that come my way, no matter the trials I may face, you promise that you would see me through so I will trust in you I will sing praise and sing praise I will lift my voice I will sing praise I made my choice I will sing praise in all I do, I will sing praise to you. No matter the storms that come my way, no matter the trials I may face, you promised that you would see me through, so I will trust in you. No matter the storms that come my way, no matter the trials I may face, you promised that you would see me through, so I will trust in you. I will sing praise to you. I will sing praise to you. You know, God never promised us that there wouldn't be any storms, did He? He never said that life would be parade. By the way, I hate parades. There's nothing worse than being a politician in a parade. 
But what he has promised us is that no matter where you are at, he will be there with you. Amen. And what he has promised us is that he'll never leave us and forsake us. And we could praise him all the time. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. In you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my dread. In you I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded by my faith in you. I lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my hands. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my voice. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my everything. Oh, Lord, my God, to you I give my life. In you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my strength. In you I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded by my faith in you. I lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. In you, in you I find my peace. In you, in you I find my strength. In you, I live and move and breathe. Let everything I say and do be founded on my faith in you. I lift up holy hands and sing. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring. Let the praises ring.
with us as we worship the Lord together and sing. Sing with me. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name, O Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name. O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name. O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Our right, to help us worship the Lord this morning and give him. Has God been good to you? Then let's... Show our appreciation back to him this morning that are given. Brother Carl, would you lead us in this offertory prayer?
You may be seated, but we invite you to help us worship the Lord. Praise God, praise God, praise God, who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, praise God, praise God, who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. you look in your bulletin, there's a printed prayer list that's there. <clears throat> Many that are in need of our prayers, and we encourage you to look and follow along with that. We've got a lot of folks that have been uh, out for a while that are back. I see Brother Delbert. He's waving at me back there. Made him, made, got him back out of the hospital through rehab, and he is here, which is an amazing thing. Good to have Brother Delbert back. We have enjoyed it as well. And have some folks who have come home for a little bit. They're standing up hugging now. Good to see Karina, Tom. Wow, as well. Kind of back there in the back. Hollis as well. Good to have you guys who are passing through. I know, on your way probably back to Illinois. Is that where you're going back? They've been vacationing or visiting friends, so it's good to have them here with us this morning as well. A lot of folks that are here with us, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But you see your prayer list there. I do encourage you to remember those that are there on the prayer list. We've asked you. The many that are traveling today. It's a holiday weekend. So please keep those in your prayers that are traveling. If you know from our 40 days of prayer for our schools, anybody know who we're praying for today? Librarians? Library administrators? That's not what they're called now. What are they called, Ms. Kim? Library media specialists. I have to get all that in there. I knew the principal would know, so I make sure we got that in there. So we're praying for them today, and then tomorrow as well, we get to pray for those who have a spirit of purity among our students, for those seniors that will be graduating for later on, for students and staff not to get discouraged. You say, Brother Mark, it's too early in the school year to get discouraged. No, nah, it's not. I promise you. And pray for the physical health of our students and staff as well. So we've been encouraging you to do that. 40 days of prayer, and it doesn't end until September the 19th, so there's some for those lists out there, if you'd like one, pick one up. So you know how to pray for our teachers and for our staff. Also, at the end of the service today, you'll have the opportunity to be a part of the Apple Tree Ministry. Our women active for Christ do this every year. You come up and pick a student that you can pray for personally throughout the year. And you'll get a picture and you can meet them and find them and talk to them as a part of our church family. So we'll do that at the end of service. But we believe God answers prayers. Amen? Well, some of you do, some of you don't. Okay? I believe God answers prayer, and that's why we stop and we always pray several times during our service, because we believe God does answer prayer. And if you look around you, there are answers to prayer sitting all around you. In fact, if you didn't know it or not, you're in it. Somebody pray for you, so you come to know Christ as your Savior. Maybe a mom, a dad, a grandparent, I don't know who it was, staff, teacher, pastor, youth pastor, somebody prayed for you. God heard their prayer and sent the gospel into your life, and you sit here this morning as a testimony of answered prayer. Did you know that? So that's why we pray. Don't ever give up. In our basket, there's names of those over there who prayed, and you see on your bulletin, you can jot a name down, put that name in our prayer basket. We pray for those every week, so remember that. Uh, an answer to prayer sitting here today as well. Brother Denver McKay's been over in Ivory Coast for the last three or four weeks building and working over there. He's here today. Listen, just to travel, that, that's an amazing thing, to be on a mission field and do all he, what he does, and get back safely. Uh, if you know Denver, to get back safely is a good thing. Uh, he's back safely with us as well, after all that he does. So God is good. And all the time, God is good. So we stop and we thank Him. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Some of you guys who are Attenders of Welch College, when that music started, you felt like you had to stand up, didn't you? You thought, oh, i got to sing the doxology. i got to stand. We did that every day at chapel. 
So good to have you here with us this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and just stop. Thank God for answered prayer. Thank God for what He is doing and what He is going to do. And Maybe there's somebody on your heart right now you want to pray for. Pray for the ministries of our church. Listen, God is active and doing well. I, yesterday I heard a great report. We had Master's Men. We changed it. It's on a Saturday morning now. Did you know that? 20 plus men that were here. Isn't that great? God's doing great things. And we're going to continue to see God do great things in our lives and in our church, in this community. So stop for a moment. Let's pray. Thank God for what He's doing. I also pray that God's going to continue to work in our lives. It is good to have Brother Tom Williams with us. Brother Tom was a deacon in our church for many years. Brother Tom, I'm going to ask if you would stand and lead us in prayer at this time. you to take your Bibles, and I'm going to give you some time to find it, the book of Amos. It's actually in the Old Testament. I know some of you are going, wow, is that a book in the Bible, really? Amos, give you a little bit of time to find that. You may have to look in your index. It's not a book that you just turn to as your favorite book of the Bible. 
It's not one of those books. Amos was a prophet of God. And oftentimes when we look at prophecy, we look at it in a way that says, oh, I want to know what's going to happen. Well, Amos is going to tell us what's going to happen. But a lot of times we leave it at that. As you look at prophecy, sometimes it looks discouraging. It looks like when it's fire and brimstone and death and destruction and removal of countries into exile, and it's just so horrible. But I want you to understand something. God put prophecy in place really as a way of encouraging us. We'll talk more about that as we walk through this book of Amos over the next few weeks. Amos was a, a countryman. We'll look in the text and we'll talk more about that too. But he was from the country. He kept, God sent him to the big city. My grandfather grew uh, up on a farm and he was a farmer as well. He died when he was 95 years old and all he ever did was farm. I had the privilege of spending some time with him during the summers. When he was about 91, he told my mom, he said, listen, when it's time for me to go into a care facility, a nursing home, I'll let you know. Well, he had farmed and uh, and done that all of his life, and still at 90, he was still farming. One day he called her, he's about 91 at that point in time, and he said, it's time. She said, time for what? He said, it's time for me to go to the nursing home. She said, okay, let me try to find a place. He said, I know where I want to go. Told her exactly where he wanted to go, where he wanted to be at, and so uh, my uncle took over the farm and the family, and Everything kept on going just fine. There again, my, my grandfather grew up on a farm. Most of the time, he never went into a town of probably more than 10,000 people at the most. He lived in a place called Barney, Georgia. Don't look, Google it. That was close to a town called Hayhira, Georgia. Don't Google it. That was close to the metropolis of Moultrie, Georgia. Don't Google it. But the only great thing about Moultrie was it had a farmer's market and a cell barn. We grew tobacco and he would take the tobacco there to sell it at the cell barn. And sometimes when we were raising hogs, we would take those also to the place there, the uh, processing plant where they would take care of the hogs as well. That was where in Moultrie, that was the big town. We went probably about three times a year into the big city of Moultrie. So his life was spent around Barney and Hayhira. So you can understand, uh, he didn't know much about the big city. He would sometimes go by a tractor about every 10 or 15 years, or a truck 15 or 20 years. So he never really made it to town very much. So when he retired and went into the nursing home, he'd been there for about a year or two, I can't remember exactly what it was, and he called my, my mom called one day and said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing well. He said, they have this new thing they're giving me to eat. And, he, and she said, Really? What is it? He said it's called yogurt. He never had yogurt in his life. Didn't know what it was. So the nurses were explaining to him that if he ate yogurt, it was good for him, good for his health, good just for all around stuff. It's just good. You need to eat some yogurt every day. And his statement to my mom was, could you imagine how long I would have lived if I'd been eating yogurt all my life? <laughs> He just didn't understand the ways of the city. He didn't understand all the newfangled things that were out there. He just grew up on that simple farm. Well, Amos was one of those guys. He was one of those country guys who just came into the city, and when he came into it, he was just amazed. God calls him. Amos chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, two years before the great earthquake. And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The habitations of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. But I will send fire into the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Benadad. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant of the plain of Avon. And him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden and the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Kerr, saith the Lord. That sounds pretty serious. So here's a country man. If you know anything about Amos, probably 30 40 years after the ministries of Elisha, here comes Amos. 
Egypt, who was once a world power, has basically left the scene and Assyria has stepped in and has control. Israel and Judah are somewhat vulnerable at this time. If you know anything about the country of Assyria, they would use terror and propaganda and even its military power if needed to to take over a nation. And anyone that resisted against this great nation would be tortured basically and forcibly deported or exiled from their nation. So what was Israel's hope? How could they endure this? Well, Amos is going to tell us their only hope was to return to God. Israel basically had two alternatives or two choices. Either repent of their sin and idolatry and turn back to God or to go into exile. Elijah and Elisha, the two great prophets that we know so much about, had pointed to God's work by the great miracles that they had done, trying to call Israel back into a right relationship with God. But Israel would need something different. Judah would need something different. A new breed of prophet that would not just show the great works of God, but that would point the people of God back to the Word of God. You see, Amos is fixing to preach to a nation that had never known defeat. Their kings were strong at this time. They were capable. They were vigorous. This kingdom looked like the kingdom of David and Solomon during their great reigns. Israel had everything going for them. You remember that Israel had undergone several cultural revolutions. Israel was once known as the fighting farmers. And now they were citified, sophisticated, cultured, proud. And they imagined that they were safe. But they were wrong. Assyria was too much. Another cultural shift had taken place. They went from a nomadic life and from the wilderness to farmers and now they brought them into this great city of God. They had encountered the Canaanites who brought into them idolatry and idol worship. God brought the temple in to try to correct that. Now they were in an urban culture that was just as dangerous. They became preoccupied with getting rich and extorting money from the poor. They started taking bribes. And idol worship is now the accepted norm. And even the priesthood of God has been defiled. Does it sound like any country that we talk about now? But Amos doesn't understand any of that. Amos doesn't understand the city culture, the urban culture. He's not familiar with that. He doesn't understand what Israel has done. He's from the country. And when he walks into the city, he is shocked by what he sees. The question is, would Israel accept the message from a sheer country preacher? You see, Tekoa, what we talk about there, is six miles from Bethlehem. It was a town on the edge of nowhere. So would the children of Israel listen to a man from nowhere? So what was Israel's problem? Let's go back and step back in time just for a moment. And it's recounted in the first two chapters, and I'm not going to read them all here this morning, so don't panic. I encourage you to do that. But the first problem that Israel really faced was they had some bad neighbors None of you have bad neighbors, I know that. In fact, the text that I read to you, it says the phrase three transgressions and even four is seen several times in the next several verses. It does not mean that the four transgressions were added to the first three. It means that the fourth one was the one that broke the camel's back. It pushed God over the edge. So as you read through this text, you will notice there were some countries there that pushed God over the edge. And they will face the judgment of God. Notice the first one that we read about is Damascus. Syria, in other words. It was a constant enemy of Israel. If you understand what happened here, you can go back and read in 2 Kings chapter 10 and 2 Kings chapter 13. They had brutally beaten the people of Gilead. They had destroyed them basically. 
And God remembered what had happened there in 2 Kings chapter 10 and how he, they had treated the people of God. And it says there that the Syrians would reap what they had sown. We know that Assyria comes onto the scene and they will be the one that would destroy and capture and deport the Syrians from where they were at. And then verses 6-8, through we read about Gaza or the Philistines. We know what the Philistines had done to Israel before. They had raided and raped Israel many times in every settlement. They delivered even the Israelites over to Edom. In 2 Chronicles chapter 21, we read of that great story. And because of that, the Philistines had gained great wealth. We know from history that later God would completely decimate the entire Philistine population. And Assyria would be the instrument of God to deal with that. And then in verses 9 through 10, we see even the country of Tyre. It's probably one of the most powerful places that there was during this time. They were great traders and great colonists. They were once a friendly nation to Israel, but then they began to buy and sell the Hebrew prisoners of war, mainly to the country or the people of Edom. We know what would happen to the city of Tyre. It would be judged and the city would be burned. The Chaldeans would do that under Nebuchadnezzar. You see, these first three prophecies probably made Amos a popular man in Samaria and Israel at the time. Because Israel didn't like these people either. So yeah, when you're prophesying or you're talking about how bad the neighbors are and what's going to happen to them, it's really easy for us to get excited. Now church, stay with me just for a minute. You're saying, Brother Mark, what does this mean to us? You see, it's sometimes really easy for us as the people of God when it looks like judgment is falling on them old heathen sinners out there to get all excited about it, right? Amen? Oh, it is. Let's just be honest. We're in church, right? So sometimes when we see people who have sinned against God, who are not living lives that please God, and we see something befall them, some injury or something bad happen to them, sometimes it's really easy for us as the children of God to say, they got what coming to them. Listen, I don't know about you, but I remember very vividly. And we need, we need to accept our faults here just for a minute. But I remember very vividly in many churches when the AIDS epidemic first broke out, there were pastors who stood in the pulpit and preached that, that was God's judgment on the homosexual community. Now folks, we've got to be really careful when we start crossing those lines. In fact, I know some people that were excited about it. Yeah, they're getting what they deserve. They've chose to live that lifestyle. And listen to me, God's going to take care of them. God's going to punish them. God's dealing with it now. And they're going to, they're going to reap what they've sown. And folks, listen to me. We had some, we, we, I, I, I lived through it. We had some guys who got really excited about that. See, we, it's easy for us to do that. And we can do the same thing. Listen, we, we, we got folks that are de dealing with gender identity problems and gender confusion. We, we, and listen to, we're, we're looking around and we see that maybe those relationships break up and homes deteriorated and children. We say, listen to me, they, they made their choice, they're getting what they deserve. And somehow or another, we in the church, we've gotten a little excited about that. Church, listen to me, look at me for a minute. We better be careful. Because if I read Scripture anywhere, and if I understand it correctly, judgment begins with the house of God first. And when we start making our judgments, and we start saying that God's intervening, God's doing this, and listen to me, it's real excited about Listen to me, when it's happening to somebody else, but when it's happening to us, oh, wait just a minute here. That's the, be careful. And I'm sure Israel, when all this was going on with Damascus and Gaza and all those kind of things, they were looking around saying, yes, God is on our side and judgment is coming down and God has given them exactly what they deserve. Let me, just, let me remind you of something, folks. You, some of you ain't going to like me. But when we stand before God, Christ returns and that great judgment day happens, 
I, I want you to understand something. God's not going to be over there rejoicing that people have rejected Christ and they're going to spend eternity in hell. That's not going to be a great day. That'll break the heart of God. And some have another, we've got it in our mind that God's going to look at them and say, you made your choice and you're depart from me, I never knew you, and God's going to enjoy that somehow or another. No, just as it breaks the heart of God every time a person rejects Christ as His Savior here on this earth, it will break the heart of God when that happens that day. Please, please, do not ever think that God enjoys that kind of horror and that kind of terror. That is not our God. Is He a holy God? Yes. Will there be a time of judgment? Yes. Is that something God wants? Read Scripture. He was not willing that any should perish. But all should come to repentance. That all should be with Him in a place called heaven. That is not something He desires. It's not... Listen, how passionate is He about that? He sent His only Son to die on a cross. That's how passionate He is about that. And I'll say it again. And I want you to understand this. You'll never, listen to me, there's not one person that will ever walk the face of this earth that you will look into their eyes. I don't care what life they're living, I don't care where they've been in their life or what they've done in their life, there's not one person that you will ever come face to face with that God does not love. I don't care what they've done. I don't care what they're choosing to do right now in their life. I'm convinced that God still loves them. And God is not willing that any should perish. And we as the church need to understand that. It'll change the way we minister. It'll change the way that we worship. It'll change the way that we live. If you honestly believe that. Let's get a little bit more personal. Israel has some problem neighbors. But it also has some problem relatives. You ain't got none of them, do you? <laughs> Family. Mm. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 talks about Edom. This was a God-imposed or God-impressed brotherhood that Israel had made. Numbers chapter 20, verse 14, it talks about this brotherhood Edom had with Israel. The wars with Edom during the reign of David and Solomon, they were somewhat defensive wars, but they increased. And as those... Wars increased. The bitterness between Edom and Israel increased as well. You see, the worst thing that could happen to an Israelite when he was in war was to fall into the hands of an Edomite. Because the Edomites treated their brothers with cruelty. We know later that Edom would fall into the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians both. In fact, Edom's fall was at the heart of Obadiah's ministry. So obviously when Israel saw this happen to their brother who had turned against them, who was so bitter and cruel to them, surely this must have been pleasing to Israel and they wanted to listen to Amos. Go get them, Amos! <laughs> oh, heathen relatives that i got this and I've, had, I've tried to be nice to them. I've invited them to supper and breakfast and lunch and I bought them Christmas presents and they still are the most ungodly people I've ever met. Get them, God! <laughs> You, ever, you got one like that in your family? Don't raise your hand because that'd be bad. Yeah, you love them because they're family, but you sure don't like them. Then he gets to the next relative, Amon, there in verses 13 through 15 of chapter 1. You know, Ammonites had started from a very shameful beginning. This happened when Lot's daughters had children by their father. Ammonites were worshipers of Molech, which involved child sacrifice. Baal Peor, if you remember anything about that god, it was the god of openness. There were no restraints. These were the people that just lived life however they wanted to. They invaded oftentimes the cities of Israel. In fact, they would commit great atrocities even to pregnant women. 
killing the mother and the child. These were horrible people. We know later on the Assyrians would come in and destroy one of their greatest cities. Then we talk about Moab in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Same kind of people. Connected with Lot's story as well. They would seduce Israel into worshiping a god called Chemosh. He was the god, king god of all gods of the Moabites. He was known as the destroyer and the subduer of all men. We know later the king of Moab would offer his own son as a sacrifice. Trying to please the God of all gods. We know from history that God would take the Babylonians to destroy the Moabites. In fact, if you know at that point in time, they exist, cease to exist as a nation. So now we got the troublesome relatives. <laughs> People that we're supposed to love. Let me just stop and put a little reality check here. Uh, folks, this is, this is church folk. This is the brother and sisters of God. You know, it's, it's one thing out there, the culture out there, it's really easy there again to look at that and say, God, yeah, get them. Judge them. But then when it comes to our relatives, our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a little bit different. Right? No, it's not. No, it's not. You see, I, I've, I've witnessed it as a pastor that there are people come here and cry and plead and ask God to forgive them of their sins. And I've heard their own family members when they get up from there saying, it'll never last. Folks, what? They'll just turn their back on God again. That wasn't really, they didn't really mean it. They're just in trouble. <laughs> it'll never last. Listen, that's, that's not just your family. That's, that's now your brother and sister in Christ, and that's, that's what you think? It's really easy for us, they're getting to know the past and the struggles that people have been through. And listen to me, it, God can't help them. Brother Mark, you don't know how many times they've hurt me. Brother Mark, you don't know how many times they've betrayed me, how many times they have hurt our family, how many times they have, they have destroyed everything we have tried to do for them. Brother Mark, you don't understand... They deserve. Don't raise your hand. You ever said that? You ever thought that? See, that's what was going on here. Israel had some, they had some bad relatives. And these relatives had, had punished them. They'd done captured them, taken them to captivity. They'd destroyed their children. They'd been led them in idolatry and worship, and they had taken them to these horrible places, and Israel is looking around, and they hear the judgment of God pronounced by Amos, and they say, finally, somebody's going to do something about this. You know that happens in the church sometimes. Uh, last week I got in trouble, I'll just get in trouble this week too, so stay with me. Somebody who comes to church, you know how they are, they haven't been out of church for a while, and they come to church, they walk up singing in the choir and somebody comes running to the pastor. Brother Mark, are you going to let them sing? Okay. Well, I know they haven't been to church in a while, so you're going to let them get You're going to actually let them get up. Brother Mark, do you... So do we, where, where do we want, how far do we want to take Matthew chapter 7 there? You see, you see the problem that we start to have when we start looking at our relatives? <laughs> and somehow or another, the, the church of God, the people of God, should be the most forgiving, kind, compassionate, loving people that they are. But to be honest with you folks, sometimes when we see other Christians fail along the way, guess what we do? We get up and we celebrate it. I knew it wouldn't last. I knew they didn't understand what they believed. I knew they were going too far. Listen, I have seen it time and time and time again. Listen, I, I, mm, I had a dear friend. Good, good friend. The other day we were talking about something and it was a pastor of a church, a non-denomination, big church. And you've probably seen it in the news where he got involved with alcohol, 
basically lost his ministry, lost his family. Churches without a pastor. He said, I knew that wasn't, I knew that wasn't true. It just goes to show you what that kind of... And I began to stop and say, hold a minute, do you understand what you're doing? You're, 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 you're approving that a guy who was once a pastor is now an alcoholic and he's lost his family and he's lost his ministry. And you're okay with that? Because it proves your point something about a non-denominational church? Is that right? I remember Jesus saying, if they, listen to me, if, if they're... If, if, if they're preaching, if they're for us, don't worry about them. Let them go. <laughs> Maybe they're winning some. You, you see the dangerous folks? We've got to be really careful. We've got to be really careful. So, okay, I get it, Brother Mark. The culture out there, sometimes we need to be careful here. But then, look what comes up in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Now we got it getting personal because Judah comes into the scene. Now Amos done quit talking about the folks out there and the folks over there. Now he's directing his attention directly to me. Judah was a disobedient nation. They even began to despise the law of God. At the root of all this disobedience was idolatry. Remember what the first commandment was, thou shalt have no other what? God before me. Now not only have they rejected truth, they were embracing the lie. Folks, listen to me. We're talking about us. Then they actually began to believe the lies and live them out. What was false to them had now become truth. Starting to sound anything like today? Now here's the dangerous part. Stay with me for a moment. So first of all, I began to doubt truth. Then I began, not only there to, began to understand the lie, but then I began to live out the lie. Then I began to embrace that lie. So you know the natural progression is, not only that I reject truth and I embrace the lie, now I have to reject the source of truth. Who is the source of truth? Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. So when I began to, listen to me, when I began to doubt the, the authority of Scripture, when I began to doubt, doubt the source of Scripture, you see the dangerous place that I am. When I look at the Scripture and say, well, it really doesn't mean what it says, or it means something different than what it says, and I begin to take the truth and turn it into a, a lie, then I begin to embrace that lie. The natural progression is to reject the source of truth which is God. So why do you think we have a whole culture right now that is looking for truth? It's because they have rejected God. And because of that, stay with me for a moment. The entire foundation of what Israel was and who they were were now being eroded because they began to neglect the Word of God and they would eventually fall into the hands of the Babylonians. Now I want to say something. I don't have time to preach the message right now. But when you reject the Word of God as the absolute truth of God, I want you to understand the dangerous progression that you're making into the point where you will eventually reject God. Why do we as free will Baptists believe in the total inerrancy, infallibility, inspired Word of God? Because we know if you begin to doubt the truth and the integrity of the Word of God and the authority of the Word of God, you will eventually come to the place where you doubt the authority and the truth and the integrity of God Himself. Look at me. You cannot separate the Word of God from God. So Judah's bad enough, but then he gets to Israel. Look at verses chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. And let me remind you of something just for a moment. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. You jot this down and go read it. But everywhere in Scripture, if I understand it correctly, sin among God's people is more serious than sin among the people who don't know God. 
Did you catch that, church? Sin among the people of God is more serious than sin among the people who don't know God. If you read these verses, it will prove out my text, out my point. The case was, look what Israel had begun to live in their life. Injustice, immorality, ingratitude, intolerance. People were being treated like merchandise. Pornography, rampant. Human trafficking, rampant. Our culture today. We run, church, listen to me, we run from those who need our help the most. Because we don't want to get our hands dirty. People who are struggling with... I said this before. Stay with me for a minute though. You know what we want in the church today? We want good sinners. <laughs> we don't want the ones that are bad. We don't want the ones that are struggling with addictions and problems in their life. No, we just want the ones that can come get cleaned up really quick and send them home. And they start tithing and then they start coming on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And they're, they're just great people. That's the ones we want. We don't want the ones that... Hmm. We run in from the people who need us the most. Look around in our city. Look around in our community. We're running from the ones who need us the most. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness was still prevalent in Israel and is still prevalent in the church today, folks. Let's just be honest. The church began to have an attitude of entitlement toward God. The church has developed a never enough mentality. How do I know that? Look at the consumerism in churches today. Read the text. The Nazarites, the people who had sworn to God in a secret vow, a solemn vow, were tempted to violate their very own oath by the people of God. Not the world, but the people of God. Christians, godly people, were called fanatics and ridiculed by the church themselves. Hello? Sound familiar? Yeah, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian just good enough for God to bless me. I don't want anybody to think I'm this radical Christian. I don't want anybody to think there again, I'm a fanatic. I don't want anybody to think I'm sold out to God. And the, listen to me, and the people, listen, you can look at it at your school, you can look at it at work, those people that, 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 that are dedicated and pouring their heart out to God in every part of their life, you know what we do sometimes? We, we ridicule them. We make fun of those people. Read the text in verses 6 through 12. The pastors, Christians were said, be quiet. Quit preaching like that. Quit talking like that. Quit causing problems, pastor. We don't want to change. You see, God had been very gracious to Israel, but they still rejected God. Verses 13-16 through 16 of chapter 2, you can read them there. God pronounces a sentence. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart press that is full of sheaves. Therefore the flight shall perish from the uh, swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handles the bow. And he that is swift of the foot shall not deliver himself neither. Shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. You know what Amos said there in the last part? He said, I've seen enough. He walked into that city from the country. The old country preacher. He walked into the city and said, I've seen enough. Something's got to change. Folks, I've got to believe that God's saying the very same thing to not just the church and not just to America because we can try to apply this to America and we can try to apply it to the church of today. But folks, listen to me. We've got to take this personally. There's some things that's got to change. Get a good look at ourselves. Look at who we really are. Things must change. 
It's going to have to start with Israel. The believer, the church, that's us. It's easy to apply this to America. It's easy to apply it to the church. But we don't want to apply it to ourselves. Brother Mark, why are you so excited today? Because I know the outcome. I see the outcome of what's waiting if we don't change. If there's not a time of repentance in our own personal lives, if there's not a time to stand for the truth, if there's not a time to live out the truth, I know the results. I see what God is going to do. And need I remind you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. And if He's just as serious about Israel's idolatry and Israel's attitudes and Israel's lack of standing up for what is right, if He's serious about it then, He's serious about it now. I know what you're saying. Here's what you're thinking. Well, Brother Mark, this culture out here in this world, they just don't like us. We don't have a chance. You got it. Well, my family... They don't like me. They've led me down a wrong road. And I've, we've just had a lot of problems. Yeah. I grew up in a horrible household and these people have attacked me and punished me. Brother Mark. Well, Brother Mark, you just don't understand. I come to church and people don't, they're not friendly, they're not kind, they just don't like me. Brother Mark, I can't even come to church. So what do you do when the culture's against you, when your family's against you, and your church is against you? You know what you do? You stand. You stand. You don't quit. You don't let the culture change you. You don't let the family discourage you. You don't even let the church... I'm putting that in quotation marks. You don't even let them stop you. What do you do? You stand for truth. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be worth it? Yes. Are there going to be some people that feel comfortable about it? Yes. When you start stepping out and helping those who need help the most, is somebody going to look at you and say, man, you're going too far? Yes, they are. Are they going to try to discourage you? Yes, they are. Are they going to tell you, listen to me, we can't do that. We can't reach them. That's not who we are. Is somebody going to try to stop you? Yes, they are. Do you quit? No. What do you do? You stand for what's right. You stand for the truth. You stand for... God, you stand for what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Let them call you radical. Let them call you a fanatic. Let them call you whatever they want to. It does not matter. Stand for the truth. Why? Because somebody's depending on you. Because God said, that's what I want you to do. Stand. Now, I know what you're doing. Racing through your mind right now is a bunch of people who need to hear this message. But you know what? God puts you here today to hear this message. You can, you can look around and tell, boy, they need to change. They need to get their act together. They need to get their heart right with God. You, I, you, 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 heard, you had somebody going through your mind right now, didn't you? They need to get straightened out because you, you, you know what they've done to me. You know what them people at work, you know how it is there? You, you, got some, you got names just racing through your mind. Let me, put you, let me please put this one name in your mind right now. Your name. Because the Word of God speaks to you first. Me first. So when is the time to change? Now. I stand now. And no matter what the world says, no matter what the church says, no matter what my friends say at school, no matter what my family says, I am going to stand for truth.
Will you do that today? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You. Israel failed. They were surrounded by ungodly people. Their family had become ungodly. Led them into idolatry. The brothers had discouraged them. Defeated them. They wanted to quit. The Lord, You sent us simply simple country preaching there to say stand, change, repent, turn back. And God, i got to believe You're speaking to someone here right now this morning who maybe they've grown up in a hard environment, maybe they've grown up some difficult things in life, maybe the church has treated them wrong, maybe their family has treated them wrong, and listen, all they want to do is run from God. I'm going to ask, I'm going to plead this morning that they don't run from God, they run to the true living God. That the church today, that we run to You. That we don't run away from, but we run to the culture. We don't run away from our families, we run to them. It's time to change, and that change has to start now. Because it will change the way we see people. It will change the way we minister, the way we serve, the way we love. God, we need You today. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Maybe the Holy Spirit spoke into your heart today. I'm going to invite you to come. Just kneel at this altar. This is between you and God. Lord, there's some things I need to deal with. I've been hurt. I've compromised. I need to surrender my life back to you. I need to repent. I need to change. Brother, help me, God. Won't you come as we sing together? Out of my bondage song. I want to change, Brother Mark. I need to change. Jesus, I come. Jesus, come on. I come. I need to change. Into thy freedom. There's something you're battling. Gladness Some help you need. Won't you come? Jesus, no excuses. I come no regrets. Not the culture, not your family. Out Don't blame them. Don't blame the church. Into thy heaven, Starts with you. Out of my Change you. And into thy Won't you come? Wealth, out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come to Thee. With your head bowed just for a moment, you may want to come pray with these that are gathered here. I invite you to come pray with them. This, this is hard, I know. Nobody, nobody likes to admit they need to change. An attitude, an action. You know what I'm talking about. This is the time to start. It all starts here. Now, be real with God. We're going to sing one more verse. Listen, if you came, I don't know why you came, it doesn't matter why you came. But I believe God put, put us here for a reason today to hear this as we sing this last verse, won't you come? Out of unrest and arrogant pride Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into Thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to Thee out of myself to dwell in Thy love out of despair to raptures above. Upward I rise on wings of a dove. Jesus, I come to Thee. Father, we thank You for these that are gathered here and those across, scattered across this auditorium. Hear the cry of our heart. Lord, help us to stand. No matter what is around us, no matter what has happened to us, Lord, no matter if no one else stands, we will stand for You. 
God help us. Help these young people as they go back into schools to stand. As men and women go into work, stand. As we meet with our families, to stand. In this community, to stand. Lord, we need You today. We love You today. It's in Your prayer name we pray. All God's people said. And uh, were you first or second? Second. You were second. But she's going to be baptized first. How about that? I'm good with that. So that means you're the youngest. Okay, this is the baby. All right, so you're not going to be able to see her when I put her down. So you just have to take my word for it here in a minute. Okay, here we go. All right. You want to turn it that way? Okay, let's turn you that way. This you take it to you. All right. You got it? Confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, hold your nose. Close your eyes. Mm. Thank you. You ready? All right. This is Reagan. You know how you can tell? She's got on purple. She also has a little freckle right there too. So if you if you see him after church, Reagan has the freckle. Freckle, okay. You want a sister to go first? Okay. All right. So this is Reagan. We're going to baptize her as well, and it's a joy to be a part of this. So I want to continue to ask you to pray for her. Write these names down, okay? So that you know how to pray for them and pray for their family as well in the days that are ahead. All right, girl, here we go. Ready? Let's turn around and face them off. You take your picture. All right, you ready? All right. Reagan, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hold your nose. Close your eyes. There you go. You made it. All right. Careful going up. 